Awesome, awesome, awesome. I know we've been shouting all night, but who's excited again to be in the room right now? I just such a beautiful picture uh, just seeing you guys worship tonight and imagining our other locations as well. And it's, it's, again, such an honor to be here. We just so value you and just it's encouraging. That, that word doesn't even come close to the full expression of what it feels. Just the encouragement to look at this room and know the call of God on each of you and that, that we are seeing it's, the world is a crazy place. But if this is happening, come on, God has great plans. And it's encouraging. Uh, before the message tonight, of course, you got to see the TV. Y'all know what's coming. When the TV's on the stage, you know what's coming. Uh, I do want to take a moment and just uh, to, to welcome a few. They're really not guests. They're part of our family, uh, starting with one of our board members, Scott Olson, who's here with his son, William. And Grace, I think I saw Grace as well, who's right here. And so we love you and grateful for you. He has one of his friends here tonight, Pastor Sandy. We want to welcome you tonight to Highlands College. And then right next to him is actually one of our newest faculty members. You're going to get to meet uh, this semester and beyond, Michael Neal. Pastor Michael Neal, we welcome you, honor you. And you look strangely familiar, like, like you and John Larson could definitely be brothers. I keep looking over there, I get that, that feel. Hey, we also have Pastor Dino Rizzo in the room tonight. Come on, CJ Blunt in the room tonight. And last but definitely not least, Miss Tammy is in the room tonight. We honor you. We love you. And actually, I said last but not least, but I, I missed one. Pastor Lance Coles, who's here on the front row. I, I, I listen. I know after that, Miss Tammy, welcome. It's, it's intimidating to go after that. But uh, uh, Pastor Lance is from New Life Church in Colorado Springs, and a dear friend of Pastor Chris, and just such a legacy relationship of our church. And we're so grateful for you, and we honor you. And I'm thankful. I'm thankful for all of Pastor Chris's friends, and I'm thankful for the value he has on friendships. And so we we honor you. Can y'all pa honor Pastor Lance tonight? It's awesome, it's awesome. There it is. <laughs> so I was, uh, this is so much fun. I'm having so much fun tonight. Uh, I was at an event last week and at the event, someone asked me, they, they, you know, they found out I worked at Highlands or was a part of Highlands and they said, tell me about Pastor Chris. You know, what, what's he really like? And I, I do get that question from time to time. And, you know, as I, as I heard the question, I know they're asking a lot about the leadership, but I honestly, I always start, before I ever go anywhere near leadership, I always start with how deeply I respect him as a husband and as a father, the way he leads his family. And I talk about how deeply I respect him, his consistency as a man and as a leader. And it, I'm telling you, so much of our success is because he comes in every single day and his consistency and his focus on the mission is incredible, um, but I never stop right there. And really, it's, it's last but not least, always talk about how at the very core, our pastor is a man of God. And the greatest compliment I, I can read in the Bible that was said of King David was that he was a man after God's own heart. And Pastor Chris, I say that to you today, working and serving with you for, for these many years now. Every single day, without fail, I have seen you pursue Jesus and all of your leadership flow from that place. We are blessed to have a chancellor and a senior pastor like Chris Hodges. Come on, stand to your feet and welcome him to the stage tonight at One Big Chapel. Come on, give Jesus all the praise, everybody. I said give Jesus all the praise, everybody. All right, tell your neighbor you're so lucky to be sitting next to me. Say it just like that. Just like that. Say it just like that. Man. All righty. Well, this is going to be fun. So I'm glad to be here as always. And, um, and as I've got something on my heart that I want to share with you. I think it's going to be a fun lesson. This is going to be a lesson. Let me just tell you straight up. We're not going to do a preach type message. I've got just, I'm going to teach you some stuff. And make you better. But I got lots of content, so a lot. And, uh, and, then, and then my own son, Michael, who thinks he's in charge around here, gave me a hard stop. And I was like, bro, I'll stop when I feel like it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and so <laughs> I'll stop when the content's done. But anyway, so, uh, but I want, I want everybody to get something to write with or on or your, uh, and, and if you use a tablet or a phone, would you please put it in airplane mode so that you can take notes without distraction? All right? And that's just a courtesy because I worked really hard. I want you to work a little hard, all right, too, okay? And yeah, and even, yeah that's, just, that's just called common courtesy, yeah. And plus, I have some good stuff for you. I can't wait to share it with you. 
And so I'm going to jump right into it. I am excited to be at, uh, at, at one big chapel, and, uh, and I'm excited about this brand new year at Highlands College uh, in this semester, and it's going to be a banner year in every way. If you guys uh, had any idea what we are working on behind closed doors, uh, you would, you'd want to sign up for another four years. I mean, it's, it's amazing. Seriously, we are we're working very, very hard. And I'm especially delighted not only to be speaking to our traditional students, but also our evening students. I'm so delighted. And then, of course, everybody that's at what is about eight or ten other campuses that are, uh, have students gathered at them right now. I'm so glad you're along for the ride uh, as well. Um, it's going to be spectacular. Uh, I want to do a lesson, though. I want to give you the history of the lesson first. And the history of the lesson is um, that my mentor, and, and I've been mentored my whole life. So let me tell you how I've learned. I hate to say this as a chancellor of a, of a university, I didn't really learn much in the classroom. What I learned in the classroom was I learned how to learn. And so, so I value it. It's very, very important. And that there are some things I took from my learning experiences in the degrees that I have. I have several different degrees, both business and ministry. But really what I learned, I learned from what I call models and mentors. So I looked at people who were doing it well and studied them. And then I've had people speaking into my life. Okay, almost everybody that is a mentor in my life today or throughout 40 years of ministry life, they didn't come to me. I went to them. All right. And some of them I've never met. So you got to remove your ideals sometimes about mentors. But I you just you know, you just learn, you study, you follow, you look at their patterns, you see, you know, what their life stories are and, 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 and what how they how they live. And they can't teach you everything, but they can teach you something. And so probably the greatest mentor I've ever had in my entire life is John Maxwell. And, uh, and I'm with him a lot now. And, and I'll tell you the story one day. I don't have time today to tell you the story of how the first time I approached him, he kind of rejected me. He didn't, I was trying to get into his world, and he just put the door up. And I thought, over my dead body, watch this, you know. And so, <laughs> and so I, I, I wormed my way in when they weren't even noticing me. And, uh, and about three years later, I was on his board. <laughs> so anyway, I'll tell you that story someday. Uh, but now we're actually very close friends, and he's almost like family to me. In fact, Tammy and I spent, um, it was a bucket list trip to end my 60-40 year. This is my 60-year-old, 40-year ministry year that I just finished. And we did it with a, kind of the cherry on top by going to New York City over Christmas time. And uh, when we weren't in Times Square, we were at the New York Metropolitan Opera on New Year's Eve and uh, with all the stuffy people. Anyway, so it was fun. But we were in black tie. You should have seen this picture of Tammy and me. I'm in a tux, and she's in a long gown. Anyway, I'll show you that picture someday, too. Um, but, um, but he's been my mentor for a very long time, and I'm very, very close to him. And we do travel together now, and he serves, of course, here at the school. You're very familiar with him. You don't have to know how lucky you are to have that man uh, on, our, on our board here at the school. It's the only board that he serves on is at Highlands College. And uh, he's, re- he's turned down every, he's been asked hundreds of times and turned it down, but he serves, he serves you guys. And, and he just, and he, won't, he wouldn't probably want me to say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. He just crossed the million dollar mark of his own personal investment into this school. So y'all honor John Maxwell, everybody. So. So he does a leadership, he does a bunch of leadership events all year long, but he does one paid event that people attend that he lets me just come to, and he only allows 100 people to come to it, and they pay $15,000 to be there for three days. Yeah, and so anyway, so, the, uh, so here they are, and one of the, le- the hallmark lessons of this event that he calls exchange is what he calls a lesson in pictures. So what he does, he goes to his camera roll on his phone, and he goes through his entire year, and he takes about three days, and he reflects on everything that he's experienced personally, and he, and, he, and he reflects and finds the leadership lessons that he learned along the way in the journey. And it's, it's one of the hallmark lessons, and I'll, I've taken tons of notes over years of hearing his lessons and pictures. They are the most brilliant leadership principles, but they're also, they have pictures to them. They have stories to them, which makes it even more, uh, more fun. Well, I decided this past fall to kind of copy that. I was always wanted to try that lesson. So I went through my camera roll of my 60, 60th year of life here on earth, right, from January to about the end of November. And I brought a lesson to our all-staff gathering that you guys weren't in that one, but we do a year-end all-staff gathering. 
And I did these lessons that I've learned, and I did lessons in pictures, and I showed pictures throughout the year and some of the things I learned, even the hard stuff, some of the things that were some of the most difficult days of my life. And if I could characterize 2023 one way, it was kind of like the highest of highs, and really, in many cases, it was sometimes the lowest of lows. It was, it was incredibly difficult, and I, it's, it's like the most rewarding year I've ever had ever in my life, and it was really kind of strange. And I'm, I'm happy to see 2023 go. I'm ready for 2024. Um, but I thought, uh, I'm going to bring a lesson like that for you, a lesson in pictures. But, it, but here's the twist on it, and that is I'm not going to go through my year, and I'm not going to give you that lesson. I have completely done a brand new one uh, based on a comment that Michael, my son Michael, made uh, about this campus and our vision and who we are and why things are the way they are in this place. So I was making a comment about a particular space here, and I was just talking about the vision and heart behind it and what my expectations are of both the faculty and of you, the students, and what we're trying to teach you. And he said, you know, Dad, a bunch of, uh, he said, most students don't know that. They, they wouldn't know that that's what your, your vision is. They don't know that's your expectation. They don't know why that's there. They don't know the why behind that particular thing. It's just there to everybody else. Well, I'm going to go through the building in pictures. All right? And I've got 12, so I'll just go ahead and tell you the number. I've got 12, and I'm going to show you a picture, tell you a story, give you a leadership principle, and we're going to go to the next one. But the, my goal is, is to give you the why, not the what. So you already know the what. You know we have a dorm. You know we have a food hall. You know we have a, 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 a campus goods store. You know we have a communication staircase. We have all these places here. But I wondered if you really knew the why behind all of that. And it's going to be great leadership principles that you can use uh, in your very near future. And the reason why the whys are so important, I want you to write this down just as the principle for the day. And that is if I lose my why, I lose my way. If you ever forget why you're doing something you actually lose your way of get, trying to get there at the same time. And I don't want us to lose our way, so we always talk about the whys. And if you've ever watched my communication, even on Sunday, for like Dream Team, it's a perfect example. And the, the purpose of the Dream Team isn't to staff volunteers so we have enough people to run a Sunday. The why behind it is, is that because the most fulfilling part of a person's life is when they're making the difference in the life of someone else. And I don't, I'm not asking you to be on the dream team for the church. I'm asking you to be on the dream team for you. Your life would be happier if you were doing something that was touching somebody else's life. So I say it, say it, say it, say it, say it. I could just say, hey, come to the grow track and get on the dream team. That's the what. But the what doesn't drive it. It's the why that drives it. Are you with me, yes or no? Yes? All right, so here we go. So the first one, of course, is the beginning place of our campus, and it's what we call the communication staircase. It's the lobby, and it's just, it's just the, this beautiful picture of what this vision is all about, and Pastor Mark has already talked to you about this, that when people walk in, the first thing we wanted them to see, and by the way, the first thing we wanted you to see is the vision, and that is that the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. But I want to give you a leadership principle that you can never forget, and that is that vision, write this down, is a leader's greatest commodity. So it's what you see and how you communicate what you see is probably one of the greatest skill sets that we can teach you. And I want to unpack this one a little deeper than I'm going to do the others because I have so many thoughts on this that I really believe are going to help you. You know the verses like where there is no vision the people perish. The word vision in the Hebrew is the word kauzon. You have to say it like a kauzon, like you have a popcorn kernel stuck in the back of your throat. Kauzon. Don't do it right now or you'll put spit on the person in the front of his neck. I right, don't do that. But And I'm not saying calzone. That's the meat pie made by the Italians, and I want one right now. Um, <laughs> but we're fasting. Okay. Now, this is calzone, and it literally means, it's really, it means a dream. The, probably the best word is a dream. It's a revelation. And that's why the NIV, the NIV took the original language of Scripture and, and really tried to get it actually more, more accurate. And that's, they used the word revelation in the NIV. Where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. Meaning, it doesn't matter what you do if you don't see anything. So you'll just do anything if you don't have something you see and probably one of the greatest things that you can get in your lifetime as a minister, and you already are one, is that is you're seeing some things. 
like I'm seeing something. So let me give, it, show, give you an example. When I'm helping people find their purpose in life, or if I was having a conversation with you, if you're having a trouble trying to figure out, like, I don't even know what I'm supposed to do one day. I, I, you know, I probably wouldn't ask you, okay, well, what classes have you been to? You know, I wouldn't even probably even ask you, what are your skill sets? I would dig in first into what are you seeing? And this is how I've done it many times, and you ought to try this sometime, because when I'm having one-on-one conversation with someone, I'm trying to help them grab God's vision for life. I say, close your eyes. And I want you to do that right now. Everybody close your eyes. Okay? And I want you to see yourself ministering. So just see yourself. You're, you're the minister. I want you to see yourself. You see yourself ministering? Okay, open your eyes. Okay, were you on a stage or with a single person? Were you in America? Or were you overseas? Were you with young people or with the old people? Were you with lost or saved? See, like, and none of them are wrong answers. All of us in this room saw something different, and that's the beginnings of the vision that God is trying to put in your life. And I want you to start getting in the habit of, especially during prayer and fasting, of seeing. God, what are you trying to show me? And I've always believed that it's always directed at seeing yourself minister because really it's not about you. It's about the person that you're ministering to. Amen, everybody? So I'm trying to get my eyes on what do I see. And for me, when I first started in ministry, it was young people. For most young people in ministry, it is young people because you have the energy. Youth pastors, you know, you have the energy to do that. And, 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 but I, like, like most, I, I, was, I wanted to be a youth minister. I also saw myself in music because I've done music my whole life. But my first actual vision from God was I was going to be a missionary in France. It was my first missions trip. I went on a missions trip to Paris, France. And it's one of the least church nations in the world and when I realized that and when I saw it for myself and I was there, y'all, I was ready to stop everything to go be a missionary friend. So when I started Bible college and I started my training like you are doing, it was with the end goal of being a missionary to France. I'd like to point out to you, I have not been a missionary to France in 40 years. That many times what God gets you into, what he helps you see, I know I saw that. That's not necessarily going to be the end of, of the line of where you're going to go. And you just need to know that because God does with this little game that I call bait and switch, okay? <laughs> and he'll pull you here to get you there so he can get you there, which will actually get you there. And then all along the way, you're going to learn things, and that's my story. By the way, I am a missionary to France. Just this year, we sent $20 million to missions, okay? So, like, I'm still living out my missions calling but in a different way. That mission's calling has never left my life. I have never stopped seeing the lost people in France. But I'm just doing it in a different way because I'm following what God has for my life. Are y'all following me, everybody? Yes? Okay. I'm just trying to help you see. But the main thing to see, watch this. I want you to hear this. It's not what you want to see. And I don't ever want to make what you see about you. Like one day I'm going to preach. I'm going to write songs. I hope you do. But the most important question you got to answer is, do I see what God sees? Do I see what God sees? Because truthfully, I, don't, I want you to change saying, I have a vision for. I want you to sit this way. I believe God has a vision for. He has shown me his vision for fill in the blank. That God has shown me his vision for and fill in the blank. So I want you to write this down. Don't dream dreams. Let God dream the dream and you step into that dream. So I'm not asking you just to kind of bucket list your prayer time. Man, one day I'd like to write a bestseller. No, no, no. Say, God, what is your dream for my life? Show me your, what dream do you have for humanity that I can step into? My dream for humanity was I have a, I have a God gave me a deep burden for cultural Christians raised in the South been to church their whole life, and actually not, not going to heaven, and think they are. And the day I caught that revelation that there are a bunch of lost people in church every Sunday because they were cultural Christians, I got this deep burden, and God put that burden in my heart. And today, that's what we do. I always, I always tell other pastors that I'm training about how to lead altar times that I lead, I lead lost people to the Lord. Every, I, mean, I, I lead saved people to the Lord every Sunday. I lead Christians to the Lord. And they go, well, that doesn't even make theologically sense. I said, it's not theologically correct. But I'll say, you've heard me say it on Sunday. If you're a Christian and you don't know God, 
well, that's not theologically correct. These are, but, but I'm trying to identify with the person who thinks they are. And so they can give their life to Jesus and find real relationship with them. Are you following me, everybody? But the point I'm trying to make is, is vision is probably the greatest thing you'll ever possess. And just know this, you're not really stepping into the one you have for your life, but the one that God has for your life. All right, here's the second one. And that is the Bible wall. So after you walk into this uh, beautiful facility and you have this vision of the harvest is plentiful, the labors are few, we're communicating the vision God's given us. We have this red wall on both sides. I hope you guys already know this, that there's a Bible wall and every word of the word of God is on the wall, right? So it starts with Genesis on the first floor all the way to Revelation on the third floor. But I don't know if you knew the story of how this actually happened because this is a first of its kind. And as far as we know, the only of its kind wallpaper like this in the world that we know of where you have three floors where literally you have the entire Bible on the wall from Genesis to Revelation. But the heart behind it was is that what frames the vision is the authority of God's word. That we never get outside of the boundary and I say that in, the, in a good way, not in the restrictive way. We never get outside the boundary of God's word. Write it down this way, that our lives, we're trying to tell you every time you walk into this space, that our lives must be framed by the word of God. It has to be. Meaning, it is the final authority. And your generation is doing everything it can to discredit the word of God. And everybody has their truth. Listen to me. Uh, students, there's only one truth, and it's his word is truth. Can I get a better amen, everybody, right? Okay. So what do we do? Then you have to make the word of God the foundation for your life, your life. So you never veer from it, ever. The word of God is the foundation for my life. We're going to be careful to keep it as the foundation of our life. So I have a little discipline about on a question I get from time to time, and here's the question, and I'll give you the discipline. It happens all the time. Pastor Chris, what do you think about, and, then they, and you can put it, pick any topic. You could pick, you pick uh, same sex, you could, uh, relationships, you could pick abortion, you could pick, uh, you could pick, any, pick anything. Pastor Chris, what do you think about, and they always want to pull you into some kind of hot topic, and my answer is, I never answer their, uh, their question at first. I always say, what makes you think my opinion is important? And I always redirect the question. I said, all of my values and all my truth comes from the fact that I believe that, that truth is found in God's word. So let me you ask you a question before I answer your question. And that is, do you believe the word of God is God's truth? That it is, it is the standard with which we live. And if you do, then the real question you should ask me is, what does God's word say about fill in the blank? Are y'all following me, everybody? And so it keeps me out of getting out. It keeps me out of my own opinions. And I want to keep you out of your own opinions. I'm not going to read it because I can already tell this lesson is going to go a little longer than, than Michael Hodges wants me to. All right, so... Um, but, but you know the verse of Matthew uh, chapter 7, 24, that... Your, your house is the most solid when it's built on the rock. And Jesus said, that rock is if you, if you adhere to my words. But I want, you, I want to remind you, and you already know this, that the world is going to constantly, especially you, pull you out of that. There is a way that seems right to people, but in the end it leads to death. And I just want to remind you that there's a whole generation of people right now that are, that are following a different religion that, that is, it is based on their feelings and their personal views and actually what makes them happy. And I wanted to give it to you. I think you know it, but it's, it's called hedonism. Hedonism. And hedonism is the ethical theory. It's easy for you to say. Ethical, it's not like I have a lisp. Ethical theory that pleasure is the highest good and proper aim of human life. And it's not. <laughs> So all that whole, God wants me to be happy. No, he doesn't. He wants you to be holy. I think holiness will make you happy, by the way. But we don't live life for saying, well, this is how I feel. It doesn't matter how you feel. If I followed how I feel, I would not be the pastor of Church of the Highlands. Because my feelings go in direct, uh, contrary to what God's word says. We follow God's word. Say amen right there, everybody. All right, here's the third one. And that is, as you get to the top of the staircase, you have the center 
for ministry placement. Now, in fact, um, do we have two, two pictures? On, I think we have two on this one. Yeah, and we have, a, a, we have you know, over 1,000 place students already and growing, and we have these pictures. If you've never been in this space, you need to go to this beautiful place. And arguably, I don't know if you know this or not, but we gave the prime real estate of the entire building to this office. So when we were designing the building, I said, what is the most premier space in this, in this, and really I was saying it from the first three floors. Um, you have to really actually say that the, 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 probably the most beautiful space in the room is on the fifth floor on both sides where you can see the campus on one side. And of course we had that room we call the view and I'll talk about that in just a second. But in those first three floors of the college, the premier space, real estate, I asked them, what is the most premier real estate? And they showed me, I said, let's put placement there to always remind ourselves that the goal of this school was never for you to come, it was for you to be sent. And that, that why? Because write it down, the command of Jesus isn't to come to church, uh, church of the Highlands or Highlands College. The command of Jesus is to go. And have one guy say, it's kind of corny, but I, it's memorable and I like it. The first two letters of God's three-letter word name is go. The first two letters of God is go. Go. And it's just kind of a catchy little, like, we need to remember the whole goal is, is just to go. We, we're, we're to, we're to Go to the places that God called us. That's why there's this giant compass. I don't know if you ever noticed it, but there's a compass on the ground to remind us of the four corners of the earth. There are these interview rooms with maps on the walls and places where we hope you, you get interviews with pastors who want to consider bringing you on their team. We have that seal that is stanchioned off. Don't even know if you know this. I'm going to tell you about it. But there's that seal of, of, of our college and it is the second graduation ceremony that can happen. So we have a formal graduation that you'll all go through. But we have a second rite of passage ceremony. And it's the only time the stanchions come down and you get to stand on the seal is the day you get placed. Confetti, prayer, celebration. Because the actual purpose of the school got accomplished not when you came, but when you went. When you found a place to go. All right, so I want to teach you about that for a second, though, because this is one of the points of contention for a lot of you guys. Because where am I supposed to go, Jen? Where am I supposed to go? All right? And there are two questions that you're asking that I don't want you to write down because I don't want you to ask these questions. And that is too many are asking, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And too many of you are asking, where am I going to do it? I want to submit to you that those are the wrong questions. That really the real question isn't where am I going to go and what am I going to do? Because like I, in my case, if, you had, if, you had, if I would answer that question at your age, I'm a, I am going to be a missionary in France. And then for the next 20 years or 18 years, I said, and I will never be a senior pastor. The point I'm trying to make is I was horribly wrong. Like I, I was totally off. I didn't, <laughs> I not only didn't do what I said I would do, I did do what I said I wouldn't do. And, you, and the question is why? why? Why is that the case? Because I wasn't finished training when I was in those places. God was still training me. And I was still growing. You ever ask yourself the question why Jesus didn't start ministry till 30? And we, knew, we know he knew the word of God because he's teaching the religious leaders at 12 in the temple. Why? Because he was still growing. The only verse you have from 12 to 30, not 22, not 21, 30 is Luke 2, 52. He grew in wisdom, stature, favor with God, favor. With, he was still, the son of God who was perfect. And he not only knew the word, he is the word. And he was still growing. So the real question in your going, and this concerns me because I think you guys are making it too hard. Because you shouldn't concern yourself with what, like, am I going to be a worship leader or a youth pastor? Am I going to be a creative director? Gonna... Yes. The answer is yes. I hope it's all of that. In fact, my real wish for you is that what you do is everything and learn everything. And where are you going to go? I would even submit to you, it does matter. I'm not just saying take it flippantly and just go anywhere just because you got the invitation. But don't focus on it. The true question you need to ask is, who will I serve for a season and who's going to mentor me? That's the question you've got to answer. All your great questions aren't in what's and where's, it's in who's. And I want to make sure you understood that. 
Let me say it this way. It would be better for some of you to go to a church and mow the grass to have a certain person mentor you. Like the value of the person mentoring you is greater than the opportunity you're going to get first. Because I'm an old guy and I'm 60 and I'm standing before you and I'm telling you I am where I am today, not because of what and where, but because of all the who's in my life. I am here because of the who's, of people who believed in me, taught me, mentored me, shaped me, saw something in me. And I can look back now. I have the luxury of looking back. You don't. And looking back, I would just tell you, it would be worth it to go anywhere to get around certain people. So the real question isn't what are they going to offer you? How much money are they going to pay you? Do you like that city? No, no, no. Do you like that person and do they like you? And for a season, it's not even about your ministry. Go serve them. So let me tell you another confession about point number one. Uh, the vision one, and that is for the first 20 years of ministry, I didn't have a clear vision. None. I listened to the vision of my pastor, and I made it happen. I, didn't even, I wasn't even praying, God, oh, God, give me a vision. I was, I was sitting in meetings listening to the vision of my leaders and making what they were dreaming about come to pass. And I'm going to tell you, God's honoring that in my life today. Are you following me, everybody? For, so for a season, I just want you to ask the question, who do I want to go serve? Whose vision? I, wanna, I want you to fall in love with somebody else's vision. And I want you to fall in love with somebody who you know can add value to your life. And then it doesn't matter what you do or where you go to get that. That will serve you best. You receive that, everybody? All right, that's an important one. All right, number four. This is the Bible wall again. Uh, but this is the Bible wall from a vantage point. It's on the third floor. But I, I always show people when I take them on tours. So I, I bring them into the, the communication staircase first. We go up it. We go to ministry placement. And now while I'm beginning to take them to the, to the um, learning studios and, and the food hall and all in this room, as we get to the second floor, I pause at the staircase, and I say, hey, look up at the third floor. I did this with my friend Lance today. I said, look up on the third floor. I said, do you see that little white line on the third floor? And everybody squints. I don't see it. I don't see it. Like, like look over the chair just a little left. It's just one light. There's only one, there's only one white line. They can, and all they can see from the second floor is a white line. It kind of looks like that. Okay? But if you go up there to that floor, it's actually the only verse that we highlighted on the Bible wall. I don't even know if you guys know that, but on the third floor, there is one highlighted verse, and it is our third, it's, it's, our, it's our theme verse, and the same response happens every time we do it. They say, without fail, you guys thought of everything. Okay, there's a leadership principle, principle there. I wasn't just trying to show them the verse. I'm trying to show them our attention to detail, and write this down. Always exceed people's expectations because nobody was expecting you to do that. Okay. One of the goals that I have for you guys is to get you out of what I call the people pile. Okay. You're in a room full of people right now. And so there's a way to get out of the people pile. One of the goals you need to have as a leader is what can I do to get out of the pile of people? How do I get out of this 100% into the 20%, and ultimately, I believe, I want you to fight for this, get into the 2%. How do you get into the 2%? Well, there's a lot, and I'm going to teach you this lesson. It's a lesson I'm working on right now of how to get out of the people pile. How do you, how do you distinguish yourself? How do, you, how do you make yourself not just different, but, but distinctive, one of a kind, and to really highlight that? And one of the top ones is exceed people's expectations. So you as a student, I have a certain level of expectation for you. I think you should dress a certain way. I think you should act a certain way. I want you to worship a certain way. But every once in a while, you find a student who just does it a little bit more than that. And what happens is they stand out. All right? You have complete control over this, of being a person that says, I am not going to be like everybody else. I am going to exceed the expectations of my faculty, of the faculty, of the, of the people, of my peers, I'm just going gonna, gonna to do everything I can to stand out. Now, I made this decision young. This is a true story. This is not false humility. It's because I didn't have natural gifts. I was, I was, I was not smart. I was not popular. And, and I, I just, I didn't, I didn't play any sports. I didn't, I, I was so far in the bottom of the people pile. And I remember the day I decided I'm going to fight 
It's, it's the same reason why I fought when John told me, no, I am gonna, I'm going to figure this out. I'm, I'm going to go there, and, and three years later, I'm on the board of directors of his organization. That, that, that wasn't handed to me. That was, I'm going to go, and I'm going to attend everything that John does. And I'm going to try to be one of the top givers in this nation to, to equip the ministry that he has. In fact, every year, I still call. I'm on the board. I've been on the board for 20 years now. I still call the equip office, and I'm saying, are we still the top giving church to equip? If not, I'm going to give you more right now. Because like, we're going we're to be the best. Are y'all listening to me, everybody? I'm trying to teach you this. Jesus was this way. In the book of Mark says, people were overwhelmed with amazement and said, he does everything well, like everything. And I want to instill this in you because this is what makes, makes people go, wow, I wasn't expecting that. And that's where great opportunities come. That's where, that's where I'm just telling you, your leadership is going to grow very quickly because we're going to run out of time. Write down three things that I'm going to ask you to do well. And that is, number one, all things. Like if you put your hand to it, do it. Like if you turn in something, ask yourself, is this the best that this thing can be done? Is this the best paper? Is this the best report? Is this the, if, no matter what is asked of you, do it with excellence. Second one is, is do it before. My favorite people on staff here at the church are the people who say, when I say, hey, I need, uh," and they say, you know, Pastor Chris, I already already, already got that done for you. They were ahead of me on that. I love people with initiative. It's one of my favorite qualities. Do it before you're asked. And then the last one is, is do more than is expected. That's going that second mile. So if they ask for this, you give them even more than that. You start living this way. And I promise you, you get out of the people pile and you'll be, be like that little line on the third floor that exceeds people's expectations and they go, wow, I wasn't expecting that. Number five is the learning studios. The learning studios. So you guys know that we have intentionally made a decision to have an active learning style, which means we're going to give you information in uh, lectures in your own personal study time. But in the class, we're going to have discussion and, and, and have you know, work it out because honestly, we ha- you have to do that now in education because there's no value proposition edu- to, to just information anymore. YouTube and COVID changed the whole ed- education scenario where if all you're going to do is lecture me for an hour, which is what I sat through in every class I grew up in in college, I just listened to lectures, took notes, and left. I never spoke one time to any of my professors. And so, but I could, today you can do that online. You can do that on a YouTube video. But what you can't do on a YouTube video is be mentored. And so that's when we decided is that the best learning happens in circles, not in rows. So it happens through discussion. And by the way, it does. The best learning happens in circles, not in rows. Okay? So we, 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 we work it out together. We do the Hebrew style of learning, which is the Bible's written in the Hebrew learning context. Very quick teaching. I don't know if you know this, but, but before the model that we even, we're even doing right now, which is one person speaking and everybody taking notes, and there's a PowerPoint or some kind of presentation, it used to be chalkboards, right? Uh, there was this learning style in the Hebrews, which is what the Bible is written in, where they never had you in a classroom ever. You had a rabbi. Jesus was a rabbi. And he didn't put you in a classroom. He took you on a journey. And watch this. When you graduated in the Hebrew style of learning, you never got a degree in a topic. So you wouldn't get a degree in ministry or, in my case, human resource management or accounting. You got a degree. You were named. Your degree was named. You ready for this? For the person who taught you. So you would get a degree in Mark. You would get a degree in PC. And they knew when you named who taught you, they knew what you knew. Because it was a rabbi mentality, and it was always in circles, and it was always in discussions. And this is the kind of teaching that Jesus did. He was a rabbi. The Greeks changed everything. The Greeks put things in rows, you know, and, and America has a Greek style of learning. But the, this is the best style of learning, and even to this day when I train pastors, I do roundtables, and it's the best training that I can give other pastors. There's only one catch to this. You can't put this on the teacher or the person facilitating the room. And I don't know if we've ever even taught you this as a faculty. I'm going to tell you right now that the best way for this to happen in your life is always come to class prepared with questions and ready to contribute. 
I said, three things I need from you every time you show up in class. I have a question. I have done my homework. Like, I am, I am ready to enter into this class. And I have some things I want to add to the discussion. And the people who learn the most do this. They are prepared for that environment. And I wanted to make sure you had that. All right, we've got to get going. Are y'all getting anything out of this? Helping a little bit? Okay, I'm just giving you some whys. They, they get even better, I think. So this is the worship practicum room. And I could have picked any practicum room. But I want to make sure you know this, that practicum doesn't mean practice. So the purpose of a practicum room isn't for you to go in there and just practice. I've had some practice. We want you to have some practice. But I want something more than that. But this is going to take some big boys and big girls to be able to handle what I'm getting ready to tell you. Okay? Because the best practice has somebody who does it better than you watching. That's the practicum rooms were designed for when you guys who aspire to be worship leaders to have C.J. Blunt in there watching you lead worship. And then he say, that was good, but that could be a lot better. And it takes big boys and big girls to be able to handle that. All right? So what I'm going to encourage you to do is treat these lab spaces with the... Um, with the attitude of, I'm going to let somebody speak into my life. Even when they tell me stuff that I don't want to hear. So y'all may or may not have heard me hear about my very first sermon I preached on a Sunday. I was a youth pastor, so I had some reps. But the pastor that Pastor Lance and I had served for a number of years, he had some nodules on his vocal cords, and he said, I'm going to need you to preach on this Sunday. And I thought... I'm ready. I've had all this practice on Wednesday nights with kiddos. I'm ready to go. And when you do your first one, man, you're ready to go. You can preach your best stuff. And I had my best stuff. And I preached. It was good, y'all. It was good. I was preaching my heart out. People were amen. And people, getting, people got saved. That night. Pastor is on the front row taking notes. I'm thinking, look at there. Even the pastor is getting blessed. Praise <laughs> God. Praise God. And after it was over, he said, hey, I want to do a debrief. Of your message tomorrow at a barbecue place. And, um, and I said, great. I thought he wanted to revel in all my amazing revelation. He had eight pages of notes of everything I did wrong. <laughs> and he was like, like, Chris, this is not even in the Bible. Like you. Just... <laughs> and I, cr- I was sobbing. Like, no, I'm like that girl crying. I, so- <laughs> I was sobbing. And I, and I was like. And I, it hurt my feelings so bad. And I said, well, I'm never doing that again. I said that to him, I'm never doing that again. He goes, oh, no, you're doing that again next Sunday. I'm not well yet. And I said, oh, no, I'm not. <laughs> oh, yes, you are, he said. <laughs> and he took my rough edges and he shaped me. That's what you need. I hope you know that's what you need. And even when you're up here, even we have the best of the best leading in chapel like we did today, we're trying to find stuff wrong. I want you to know that. Because you don't need to come, you need to come to Highlands College and pay a tuition and spend four years of your life to us to pat you on the back and say, dang, girl, you're good. You're not, you didn't need to hear that. <laughs> you want to hear that, and we're pretty good at honoring and praise and all that. No, no, no. I need somebody to tell me what I don't want to hear Help me see what I cannot see so I can become who God wants me to be. That's what you need. And I want to make sure you're ready for that, that you're, that you're ready to be a person who can take a, you were out of pitch. I know you think you were crushing it and the anointing fell, but girl, you were pitchy. It was, it, go listen to yourself. I do this to my own team, the CJ and the team will tell you, I'll like, I'll tell, I'll tell CJ, like, hey, tell so-and-so to just listen to that last service. Just tell them to go listen to it. They don't even need me to tell them anything. They're going to crawl under a rock when they hear this on the headphones. Like, it's, they, because it, you get in moments and it gets off. And I, but they'll tell you, we do it all the time. But that's also why we get better at Highlands. We have what we call an instant feedback culture, but we don't get offended by it. And I don't know if you ever do get offended, but I want to get more aggressive with that, with your training. Because I can help you the best if I say, that was good, but let me tell you how to make that better. And when you receive it and get better, man, you're going to be some of the best lean, mean ministry machine in the world. Right, everybody? Listen to me. Proverbs says it this way. Wounds from a friend are the ones you can trust. Never trust the kisses of an enemy. 
You don't want to hear just praise all the time. You need somebody saying, hey, 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 that wasn't good. And you need to be able to take it. All right, here's the next one. I'm not even going to look over at Michael. I've got like seven minutes left and I've got five more to go. Okay. So this is the Harvest Food Hall. This is actually where it began. Michael, I was making a comment about the food hall. And, um, and I was talking about this sign that we have in the food hall where it says, this is a screen-free environment. And I'm just going to tell you the truth, uh, guys. Um, I do tours probably five a week, maybe seven a week, something like that. And I always walk by uh, when we're past that learning studios because I have this whole little loop that I do. And when I get, you know, from the last learning studio, now we're headed toward the food hall, I always begin to tell them the story of how we want to teach you guys how to be in this screen-free environment and be off your phones and teach them conversation and just kind of a whole generation that, was, that basically is addicted to these things. And without fail, there would be somebody <laughs> in there on a laptop or a phone as I did that. So I had to stop saying it um, to my guests and just hope that it turned out. And if there was somebody not on their phones, then I could say, and then I'd tell them the story about how this is a screen in, free environment. Um, and so anyway, I had a little moment where I, I had enough of that. And so I, I had one of those come to Jesus moments with Pastor Mark and Jordan and the whole team. And I just said, we either are going to do this or I'm taking that sign down. I'm going to rip it off with my own stinking fingernails. Because we, we're not going to put this up here and not do it. Okay? Now, and they say, they, were, they laugh. They know how to handle me when I'm like fired up. And I get fired up sometimes, y'all. You ought to see it. All right? But I said, man, I'm going I'm to rip that sucker down with my own hands or we're we going we to do this thing. And then that's when Michael um, uh, spoke up, as he, sh as he should, as a dean of students, as, your, as, a, as basically the campus pastor of the students. And he said, he said, Dad, they just need to know why that's important to you. I said, okay, let's do that. And, as, and then why it's important to me is that I want you to be in some spaces where you have disciplined yourself to not be digital anymore. And I want this badly for you. Because we are addicted to them, nine hours a day addicted to digital devices. And there need to be space where we literally check it at the door and come in and learn how to have conversation. And all of you know what I'm talking about. You've been to restaurants and seen whole families on their phones at a restaurant. I'm like, I always think, are y'all texting each other? What you, who are y'all talking to? Why did you even go out to eat if this is what you were going to do? I've seen husbands and wives, just a couple do it. Like, and how, to me, it's so rude. I think it's even rude. I can't stand it when I'm out to eat with somebody, and they even have it just on the table ready. Like, I'm enjoying your conversation, but if something much better than you pops up, you know, it's right there. I'm ready to go. I'm just saying, guys, this is a value that if you'll trust me, that we need to be people who know how to connect with people, not with the people who aren't even here in our phones. Can I get a good amen, everybody, right? And I know it's, it's, it's hard for some of you. That's why I, even I, this says Chancellor's Table Topics. These are actually the, top, the conversations that I would come to the table of my own kids when I was raising my family. And I came to, Michael will tell you, I came to dinners with discussion topics with my kids because I wanted to teach them conversation. And the whole point is we're not going to be like the world. Write it down. It's on the wall already over there. Refuse to be average, everybody. And let's learn how to have these kind of conversations. And then one more little point, write it down. This is what bugs me the most about digital devices. It bugs me the most. And that is, it can wait. Whatever it is, it can wait. And, and of course, that's a slogan that's used to keep people alive on the highways right now. Because so many people are... Texting while they're driving. And by the way, I just read a study that says if you text while you drive, you're seven times drunk. It's the equivalency of being seven times drunk as far as the, the, the number of casualties that take place that they can directly pinpoint. They know people who have died because they can track back to the last text they sent or something to the moment that crashes happen. And I've done at least two funerals that were, that were cell phone related myself. The point is it can wait. And by the way, it's one of the greatest ways to honor another person when you say, whatever would pop up my, on my phone is not important to me. You're the most important thing to me, and I'm going to spend time with you. Now, in the case of emergency, and there are times, you know, and we've had to do that, just say, look, I have a, my wife's at the doctor right now. If it, I always ask for permission. Is it okay if I had my phone out? And if she calls, I take that. And if they say no, it's a no. 
because it can wait. Anyway, I just wanted to put that value in you. Say amen even if you don't believe it, everybody. All right. <laughs> By the way, I have asked the team to enforce this, so just be ready. Okay. I need to get moving. The tech arts practicum is, um, is, I hope you've seen it. It's right below us. It's a beautiful new space where we can teach you film, sound, lights, workshop, all, all, this, all, all this fun stuff. And that bottom line is, is, is um, that I wanted to give you, oh, look at all the beautiful pictures. If you haven't been down there, that on-the-job training is the best kind of training. So not only is discussion a great form of training, but so is on-the-job. And you're going to have more than 800 hours of, of training by the time you you finish your, your degree here. You're going to have on-the-job training. I just want to give you one little tip on this one. This one doesn't need a lot of explanation. You know we are a practical ministry school. I just want to give you this, and I don't want you to miss it, though. We're working very hard. Look at me, everybody. We're working very hard to give you the training we think you need, but I want you to go get the training that we're not giving you. So the way I'm saying is if you're in worship prac. Go wander down to Tech Arts Prac and say, hey, show me how the soundboard works. Well, sir, you're not in this degree field. It doesn't matter. I still want to know. Okay? The, the smartest people I know do that. They learn things outside of just the area of their responsibility. They call it this, and it's my, one of my favorite qualities, curious intelligence. They found out that the smartest people aren't book smart. They're curious smart. They just want to know how that works. So I did this a lot whenever I was in tra ministry training. I would go and I just said, I asked pastors, can I sit in a counseling session? Can I see how the money is counted on a Monday? Can I see? And I, I literally went to spaces that I would, knew I would never work in, but I learned how to do it. And I want to make sure you understand that value, that curious intelligence, and, and your own initiative of training is some of the best. All right, number nine. And that is just the courtyard area, the the, the outside area, the be most beautiful uh, part. I always love, actually, after I bring them out of tech arts, I bring them out of the front door, and then I did it with Lance today, and we walk out uh, outside with the green grass, the fountains. It's, you know, the music's playing. It's, it's beautiful. And, and they always say this word 100% of the time. They look around. They see everything, and they just go, wow. And, the way, the <laughs> and it's a quality that you could learn as a leader about how to add wow to an experience. All right, I don't have enough time to teach it, but I'm going to give it to you real fast, okay? And that is, you can add wow. I learned, I learned my first wow lesson from the guy who created the Ritz-Carlton hotel chain, Horst Schultz. He found out that customers come to his hotels more than anybody else's, and they even, now Ritz, the word Ritz has become a definition of something that is nice. Oh, that's Ritzy, oh, that, right? And that's, but that's his brand name that just, he did it so well for so long but he had wow to the experience, and he only did three things. And here they are. He, he found out that people want the product that you give them with no defect. So in other words, you add wow by making your bed, picking up that leaf off the floor. Um, just like, I'm, we're going to create an environment. I'm going to live a life that is as defect-free as I can. I'm telling you, when you do this, when the, green, when the grass is green 12 months of the year, people go, Wow. And by the way, the grass is green 12 months a year at every campus at Church of the Highlands. We have something blooming 12 months a year at Church of the Highlands. Why? Because we want them to go, wow, nobody does this defect-free. They want what you deliver them in a timely fashion, which I'm not doing right now because I'm already two minutes over. Okay, so but you, you, you start on time, you finish on time, right? But this is the most important one. Don't want you to miss this. And that is you create the most wow when the people who are delivering whatever product you have, and for me it's a college, when the people who are delivering the product are nice, the biggest wow that we get from people who come on the campus is, wow, your people are so nice. Because at every place we have trained our faculty to be nice, stand up, greet. So when I come in with a guest, they stand up and greet. Now look at every student, look up at me. I need your help. I need you to do this for me. When I come through and you happen to be in a classroom and I bring a guest or I come to an area where you are and I'm coming with somebody that I'm showing the college, who, by the way, potentially is going to give, you know, six figures or more to the school to invest in you, stand up, shake their hands, smile and say, we are so delighted that you are here today. And it creates a wow experience. I'm training you to do it right now. 
And in every environment that you're in, do the same thing. I'm going to do things as well as I can, defect-free. I'm going to do it in a, in a timely fashion, and we're going to deliver something in a, in a nice fashion. Can I hear a good amen, everybody? All right. All right. I had a great story I was going to tell right there, but I'm out of time. Okay. The, the, the tenth one is, is the, the campus uh, goods store, right? And so I end my tours here. So I literally take them up the communication stairs, placement, show them that third floor verse, come to learning studios, go to worship prac, hopefully nobody's on their phone in, in the food hall, you know, and uh, yeah, go through the, right, so now we're out the courtyard, now we're back in the lobby, we, we made the loop, and I always take them over to the campus goods store, and I walk up and I say, um, this is how I end my tours, I did with Lance today, go p- pick out anything in here you want, it's on us, just, just take it. And they always go, oh, that's okay, that's okay. And I say, no, I do this for everybody. In fact, it's required. You need to go in there and find something that you want, and I want you to just take it. It's on us. Just pick out. You can have anything, anything in there. We want you to have it. And the principle that I want you to understand is because we want to teach people, to all, you always give more than you take. This is a potential donor, but I'm not asking anything from them. I am actually giving something to them. And it's just a life principle you got to have. We'll teach this some more in another time, but it's a great principle. Always give more than you take. Go read, by the way, you want a fun reading story? Go read the, the one chapter, 1 Kings 18, I think. I can't remember. Um, the, the Queen of, go look up Queen of Sheba. Go read the story. This woman came to Solomon and just dumped gold and spices and just this stuff. And, and, and as she gave to Solomon, Solomon just gave right back to her. And the Bible says that she returned wealthier than she came with the intention of giving. And that's the goal. We always make people wealthier than they came. Number 11, we're almost done. And this opens in two weeks, everybody, all right? Yeah. So it's the view. I don't know if you guys have been up there yet and seen it. This is the, this is the artist rendition, because they're actually hanging these lights actually today. Uh, it opens, it's a fine dining Italian restaurant that we are going to have open for you. I, we're, we're still working on, by the way, how often you can go. But you're going to go um, for a couple, lun- we think a couple lunches. They'll tell you the actual schedule, but a couple lunches a month and a couple of dinners a month as part of your food plan, okay? And it would be fine dining, white tablecloth, like a bunch of forks. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, <laughs> a, like that kind of stuff, okay. All right? Of course, no devices, but we're going to ask you to make a reservation to be there. And you're going to have to keep, be on time for the reservation or we won't let you in. And then we're going to ask you to, to be business casuals, which is it, it was like, 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 like how I dress on a Sunday, all right? And we're going to teach you etiquette. Like there's going to be people in there watching and saying, no, 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 that's your salad fork. And no, 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 we don't put our, like, and we're not going to, it's not going to be stressful. We're not going to be like, oh, you're a shoulder the whole time. You're going to enjoy it. But we want to teach you etiquette. I'm, we're actually, I'm bringing in the etiquette specialist to teach all of us. I can't wait to learn myself. Some of you don't even know what side of the table is your bread plate and what side is your drink glass, all right? And by the way, if you want a little trick, if you make a, this with your hands, you make a B and a D, bread plates over here, drinks over there. That's how I had to learn it anyway. <laughs> there you go. All the guys are like, dude, that helped me out a lot, all right? <laughs> but we're going to have fabulous, and I've got a chef extraordinaire, like one of the best Italian chefs I have. I have ever met, and it's going to be spectacular. We brought, we brought equipment over from Europe, like kitchen equipment. We spare no expense for you guys, all right? Okay, why are we doing this? Why are we teaching you how to have a proper conversation? Man, I need more time to teach this because I have built this church on dinners. Tammy will tell you, for years, every, twi- two nights a week, Tammy and I had date nights. We got several uh, uh, couples together, and I just shared the vision. And we knew how to entertain people at a table. And I want you to write this down. Some of the most important ministry happens at tables. They happen at tables. If you can learn how to host somebody, treat somebody well, take them out to eat, have great conversation, know what to say, know what not to say, know which fork is your right fork. Like, you know, and you can actually entertain someone. I'm telling you, you can build people who will join you in your vision and your life. Last one. And this is my office, which how many of you guys have never been in my office? Raise your hand. Okay. We've got to change that this year for every one of you this semester. Because I'm inviting all of you, not at the same time, uh, to come up uh, to my office, okay? So I've intentionally made my office kind of a, it's, it's a place full of trinkets. 
Like I have a little missions corner over here with my terracotta soldiers from, from China, from my time in China. I'll tell some of my China stories. And then I've got a little Russian hat there. Uh, two weeks before the coup, when the Soviet Union ended, I led a Soviet soldier to the Lord, and he took his cap off and gave it to me. I have a Soviet soldier's hat, and then two weeks later, there was no Soviet Union. And so I have that right there. I've got some different, I've, this flag right here, this small flag on the bottom, is the guy who served in Iran and lost his life, but he got saved watching Church of the Highlands online. Um, this flag right here flew in my honor in Iraq for a day. Uh, I didn't ask for that. They just decided to do that. Uh, the Final Four chair, Bruce Pearl gave me that. That's, uh, that, was, that was, they actually, the team sat in that chair in the Final Four last year. I've just got different, this Super Bowl trophy is from Super Bowl uh, 2010, and I mentored the pastor who, who recovered an onside kick in that game. So I tell these stories. This, this football right here um, is signed by all the living, living Heisman Trophy winners. Because I led the 1971 Heisman Trophy winner to the Lord in his car after a round of golf. And I talk about, and I'll, I'll teach you all how, all, all these types. It's just, so it's all these little fun, fun little trinkets. There's, there's that missions little corner. By the way, this mug says, Gott kennen, freik erleben, bestuben, intricken, einen, ukenagen, machen. And in German it means, know God, find freedom, discover purpose, make a difference. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that fun? So it's stuff like that. So you see some other stuff like that. And then, on, uh, and there's that flag. And, but on my desk, I have this counter that's, that's wirelessly connected uh, to our digital department, um, our data department. So every, so it takes four days to process all the connection cards from Sunday. And, and by the fourth day, they know how many people uh, have given their life to Jesus and so this thing starts kind of clicking, like a European train station. And, uh, and this is how many people have given their life to Jesus at Church of the Highlands since day one. Yeah, yeah. And it updates, and it updates, it updates every, day, every Thursday at 8 a.m. And I love being there because it adds to people who got saved from the, from the previous Sunday. And it's tick, 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 ticks away. It's one, it's, I call it my salvation scoreboard. And I keep this at the center of my desk. Because this is what it's all about. But the reason why I bring people in there and tell those stories is because of what I've done tonight. Is that tell stories because stories stick. So that's my last little lesson for you is that learn how to tell stories. Learn how to tell stories. And when you can tell stories, stories is what people remember and stories stick. And I just wanted you to know some of these principles and these places so you know why we do these things. So you can have the why behind the what. Did you get something out of it, everybody? All right. Stand up on your feet. Somebody come play behind me and make the rest of this sound really anointed and spiritual, okay? Yeah. And then I'll hand it over to Michael. And um, I've enjoyed my time with you. I hope you just got, if you got one little nugget out of all of this, I uh, ho hope you did. And I do want to invite each of you, uh, a few people at a time, up to my office and just come let's hang out and let's talk, tell stories and let you see my view of you. Uh, you can see what, what I see out of that fifth floor office. And, um, and I can't wait to have meals with you in the, in the new view room. It's going to be spectacular. It's going to be a great semester together. It's a great semester, though, if you make it one. If you say, I'm, I'm just not going to, this is not going to just come and go, and that's going to be okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give this semester my all. I'm going to give my all. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come out of the people pile. I'm going to give it my best. And I think it would be really great as we have this first chapel of this brand new semester, I'd like to dedicate it to the Lord and then dedicate ourselves, Lord, and say, Lord, I'm, you know, I may I not have everything, but I'm going to give you all that I have. And then watch God multiply it and use it in Jesus' name. So if you're with me, open your hands before the Lord right now. And, Father, we just dedicate this semester to you, uh, this time together to you. And, God, we're going to put as much energy and effort and heart and soul as we possibly can. God, we know we are so far from all that you want us to be, but God, let us just incrementally grow from glory to glory, becoming who you called us to be. And God, we're going to keep our eyes on the dream and the vision you give us. We're going to keep ourselves pliable so somebody can speak into our lives and so that we can get better. And I'll just speak to their futures right now, Lord, that everything that they will do one day, that will change the world, God. Just bless them. Give them faith for that. Give them the endurance that it's going to take to get to 30 years old. The, the time that, of our training and our growth and our development. And I speak blessing over their lives. I thank you for these amazing students. 
God, use them, we pray. And for everything, we promise to give you all the glory in Jesus' mighty name. Put your hands together and give God all the praise, everybody. Come on, one more time for PC. <laughs> How many of you know he could take all the time he wants? <laughs> it was just a gentle suggestion in the name of Jesus. But, <laughs> man, <laughs> I love you so much. And um, y'all know that he has a conviction that during 21 days of prayer and fasting, he, he doesn't go anywhere. And he let us know that because he ain't going nowhere, why not spend that time with you? And he's going to spend more time with students on the 11th. He's going to have another in residence day on the 23rd. So he's going to be with us a bunch because everything he's teaching, he wants to keep pouring into you, pouring into you, pouring into you. And I'm thankful to God for you, seriously. Anyways, I love you to death. Um, y'all give it up one more time for PC. Thank you. <laughs> And we love you a ton. And since he took his time, I'm going to take mine. Just kidding. Uh, I just got a few points. I've always wanted to touch this. Does that work? Oh, yeah, perfect. I turned to point. Um, I've never done that before. That's actually kind of cool. Thanks, Ed. That was history. Uh, so, listen, we love y'all to death. And evening, we are so thankful that you joined us for one big chapel. Come on, students. Why don't we thank the evening students? So thankful. And just so you are aware, chapel is always available to you. We wish you would come as much as you physically can. And we've got some great chapels coming up this semester. We have Pastor Mark next week, but we have even Chris Tomlin coming and Jamie kearns Lima. We have a lot of great chapels coming up. We'd love to invite all of the evening students to be with us. It's better when you're here. We love it when the evening students are here. Guys, I've got nothing else for you except we got prayer in the morning. Are you all ready for prayer tomorrow morning? We'll have the best night of sleep. Go to bed. Y'all go to bed, okay? Go to bed early, and I'll see you bright and early at 6 a.m. God bless you. Have a wonderful evening. Be safe. Love you.